This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the best place to build your portfolio. All right, here's the Final Cut Pro grading tutorial you will have wished you watched earlier. We're gonna cover everything from the basics of transforming your log footage to making it look really cinematic. And there's a lot of ways to color grade in Final Cut. There's no one correct way to do it, but there's a lot of wrong ways to do it. So I'm gonna lay things out in the simplest way I can. We're gonna move kind of quickly, but by the end, you'll know the right way to do this without screwing up your footage or picking up too many bad habits on the way. So I'm gonna use this commercial that we shot a while ago for a brand called Northwater. And you know, what you're after is probably something like this. Let's look at the before and after of a final here. Here's one way that this could have that cinematic look, but I don't want you to get too focused on this end result because this part's the easy part. It's everything before that that really matters. So let's get this back to a neutral place. I'm gonna turn off all those effects. Actually, I'm gonna delete those effects and just restore everything to the original log that it was shot in. So this is what the footage looked like. This is Canon Log 2, C Log 2. First step, before anything, edit your footage. I know it can be tempting to grade as you go, but if you're not finished editing and you start grading, you can waste a lot of time digging into files that you don't end up using and it slows down your render time. So finish your edit and then do a few preference changes. So I like to go into Final Cut, Preferences, and under General, you can choose the default color correction method. I would absolutely not use color board. I always have it on color wheels, which is the most useful, the most standard way of adjusting colors. And so all that does is if I select a clip, and I go to the color adjustment area, you can see this is what shows up by default, and that's what I like. Let's also turn on our scopes, which you can find in the view menu, but I strongly recommend remembering the shortcut, Command-7, because I turn them on and off a lot while I'm editing, so try to remember, Command-7. The way I use mine is I go to view and I show two of them at a time. One is a vector scope and the other is an RGB overlay. If you're not already sure how to read these, the vector scope is basically a saturation chart. So if I crank the saturation, make this look really bad, you can see how saturated each color is in the image. This will become very important later on. I'll show you how it works. And then I use RGB overlay as my waveform. A lot of people choose Luma. That's really common advice, but I find you actually lose information here. And I'll show you why RGB overlay is much more useful later. All this will make sense in a bit. Another little thing setting up Final Cut for grading is you're gonna to wanna to grab an adjustment layer. I've got some links to free ones you can download in the description. To oversimplify what this does, everything below it ends up inheriting the look that you give it. So you've seen those files. Now if I turn on the effects, they all change in the exact same way so that they can all match. You can imagine why this is handy, but for now we're gonna delete it come back to it later, just get it installed so you're ready. And the last thing on your checklist, make sure you have the transform LUTs for the log file that you're working with. If you shot in log, I'll explain how to use that right now. Let's get into this. Log profiles, these super flat to saturated things are very common in modern cameras. I mean, I'm shooting in it right now, for example. Even the new iPhone 12 can shoot in 10-bit log, which is very impressive, but it's the best way to get the most image quality out of your, your colors and your dynamic range. If you're not shooting a log, things are simpler, you can skip this chapter. You could, of course, do it yourself. So let's look at the most basic things. If I click on this clip, I could go over here to my color wheels, bring the shadows down, and looking over at my waveform on the left here, I can see once they start getting near zero, that means they're almost black. Then I could bring my highlights up until they start getting kind of close to 100. I never want them to actually clip, but they're you know sort of touching that 100 line. And then bring back the saturation, which I prefer to do mostly in the mid-tones and highlights um, a little less in the shadows. But you can see something like that. That's basically restoring the color and contrast to this image, but I don't recommend doing it manually like that. You should go find a good transform. So for example, part of the reason I really like the C200 is it transforms really cleanly. Like it looks great as soon as I add one simple LUT, which uh, in my case, this is a LUT that I adapted from the Alexa transform. So we can put on the log two and you can see it, it really brings it back to looking beautiful. So when you see people's before and after and they show the log image and then they show this, like that's not interesting. That's really, really easy. <laughs> Everything else is the hard part. Okay, but what did I just do? I skipped around a lot here. So over here on the right, uh, you know, there's the overall inspector. This is where our filters will end up showing up. There's the color inspector. This is where our wheels are and some of the other tools that if you click here, you can get a preview. We'll play with them later. And on the info tab here, 
there is camera LUT. Now this is one place that you can place your transform. It is the simplest workflow method. And if I go back and I select again the, the, the LUT here, um, it's very easy to stay organized and you could I could select everything and I could apply that same LUT to all the files that I'm working with. In this case though, I'm also working with some stock footage. So you gotta be careful not to apply it to the wrong thing. And the best time to use that method is with controlled lighting. So here's another different example. This is a recent YouTube video. And everything's basically the same, right? Just like this video I'm recording now, I'm sitting in the exact same place. Not much is changing shot to shot. And here's a very good trick. If you have a long take, like me talking, uh, I, I'm gonna open it up and you can see that I've actually put it in a compound clip. The way to do a compound clip is just select any video and press option G. And then inside that clip, any changes you make will show up everywhere. So if I go in here, I could turn my effects on. Now you can see my color grade. And if I click back, it changes all of the talking shots. So I don't have to go back and grade each clip individually. It can be really hard to keep that in sync. If you have a long clip, put it inside a compound clip. But now if we look at our commercial again, a lot of this is shot outdoors. There's a lot more dynamic range and shifting light values and stuff. So we wanna be more careful with it. So we're gonna do this the slightly more complicated way. I'm gonna select the clip, go to the effects menu over here and inside of color, I'm gonna select custom LUT and I'm just gonna drag that over and drop it onto my clip. Now you can see up here in effects, we now have custom LUT and I'm gonna use my Alexa adapted LUT that I like for C-Log2 and there we go. Same effect as before. The big difference here is now I can make adjustments before the transform. Does that make any sense at all? I'm gonna to try to show you right here. So if I drag this LUT onto a clip and I add, this is the incorrect transform. So this is a C-Log2 transform to a C-Log1 clip. Let's say I wanna recover those clouds. So I drag my highlights down. See how they're just becoming gray, but there's no detail there. Well, if we look over at our effects, stack here, like these are applied in the order you see them. So the top is first and goes towards the bottom. If I move that adjustment above my transform, all of a sudden I've recovered all of those highlights. Like that's a huge difference. This is what happens if you try to make your adjustments after your transform let. This is what happens if you apply them before your transform LUT. And this info panel is the first step in the stack of, of LUT. So if I apply it here, uh, there is no way for me to then later uh, recover all that information. And maybe you're already stuck at this point because you're like, wait, I don't have a nice transform LUT that makes my footage look beautiful. Well, there's a lot of options out there. I'll put some links in the description below so you can find some of them. My favorite, unfortunately, isn't on Final Cut Pro yet. It is called Cinematch. It's coming soon. It's available on Premiere and Resolve right now. But there are lots LUTs for all the different camera manufacturers. I don't really like the Canon ones or the Sony ones because let's say you're shooting on an 8-bit camera like an EOS R or an A7S II or something like that. Those transform LUTs from Canon and Sony assume that you have the more professional cameras. They didn't really design them for the consumer cameras and the transforms look weird. And why am I explaining this? Examples help more. So let's look at the built-in transform the Final Cut comes with. So this is for Canon Log2, and we compare it to the one that I'm using, there's a whole world of difference. So compare some of the different transforms and choose one that you like. Again, links in the description below, including you can purchase the ones that I use if you want. So now we wanna make all the footage that was shot on the C200 look the same. So I'm going to select that clip, hit Command C for copy, and go to other clips and press Command Shift V, like Command Shift Paste, and now you can choose exactly which video attributes you are going to apply. I don't need to apply the scaling transform, just the LUT, so I'm gonna turn that off, paste, and now this clip also looks good, so let's do that to everything. And now as we flick through, we can see that everything looks contrasty, it looks like proper footage. Transform complete, but there's still a lot to learn about them. Don't think you've mastered it because you've just found one LUT that kind of works. In fact, if you have a LUT pack and all of them just have like standard log transform, don't use that, it doesn't really work. Step two, correction. So this is at least as important as transforms. If you don't have your colors looking accurate, all those fun filters and LUTs you're gonna add later are gonna look like crap. So you gotta lay a foundation first and that's what we're doing. So these shots look pretty good overall. I mean, you know, it'd be nice to do this on one of the most majestic shots because it just looks good, but um, I think I could demonstrate it more clearly in a, a little simple B-roll shot like this. So first of all, we want to be adjusting for both the white balance and skin tones. In this case, we're looking at the white balance. Um, and what I'm looking at here is over here on the left-hand side are our RGB overlay waveforms. I'm gonna make them a little bigger so I can 
really clearly see them. And without looking at the actual image over here, I can tell that this is a little bit too blue because our blues are higher up here in the highlights. And there's also something going on down here in the shadows. So these shadows correspond to this dark part of the backpack and this streak going across the top. This is all that gray back there. So this should be pretty neutral. And fortunately, it's really easy to do that. So we're going to start by creating a correction layer. And first we look at the highlights. Honestly, you can do this by feel and just start like moving these in a circle and you can see what happens over there. See those waveforms moving around. I'm basically just going to keep moving them until they start to line up and converge. And once they're all in a line and white, that means the white balance is now neutral. Can you see that as I click it on and off? This like blue cast just disappears that yeah, you didn't even really see it before, but now you definitely see it when it goes away. And also let's keep our order of operations correct here. I'm going to move those color wheels before our transform line. And also the shadows, this dark area over here, you can see that there's some color visible in them where this should just be straight up black. So as we move it around, those will gradually start to line up, but keep an eye on your highlights too. Like everything is moving, even though I'm only grabbing the shadows. And sometimes if you move it until they are perfectly aligned like that, now we have made our highlights too warm. So we can bounce back and start to play with our highlights again, but there's also such thing as playing with it too much. So kind of find this balance where both of them are mostly white. And now if we turn this on and off, you can see we got rid of a lot of color cast there. And then the other most important thing is skin tone. So in this example, we have lots of skin tones to look at and we're going to use our vector scope a little more for this one. So I'm going to make it a bit bigger. And I find it really helpful to just crank the saturation when you're getting started, make it too saturated. And all of a sudden it gets really big over here. You can clearly see what's going on. Now make sure that in your vector scope preferences, you do have show skin tone indicator on. And that is this subtle line that is running up and to the left. And that is the universal hue level of skin tone, regardless of the complexion of the person, whether they're darker or lighter, the hue of their skin should be somewhere pretty close to that line. In this example, this orange roof up here is actually kind of distracting us. So I'm going to zoom in a whole bunch. And now uh, everything that we're seeing the vector scope, like all the orange stuff is pretty much his skin. And over here, I have a little bit of gray. Now I'm just going to kind of tweak both of those until they're, you know, pretty much lining up right on it. And then I can restore that saturation back to normal and zoom back out. You know, one more thing you might've been considering is you might've been looking at, well, what about this temperature and tint slider? Like if we're going to be fixing the white balance, right? Like why don't I drag this to be more yellow or more blue? Let me try to demonstrate why I don't like these. If I start to move the temperature slider to get her skin over here to align with our skin tone line, you can see that here in the highlights, it's starting to get like weirdly yellow. Like if I drag this far, look at how yellow the highlights are and the shadows, everything got super yellow. It's really not discerning about which parts of the image you're trying to affect. Whereas if you were setting white balance within your camera, it would look a lot more like this, which here I'm just grabbing the midtones. And can you see that I've got the skin right on the line? Like it looks a lot better but our highlights haven't moved so much. Like our highlights are still neutral, which is exactly what we want. We don't want to add weird coloration to different parts of the image just to fix our skin or our white balance. So don't use the sliders, use the color wheels. We're gonna look at the contrast. So there's a few things you could do from color wheels. Like you can bring your shadows a little closer to the bottom. If I look over to the left, you can see they're almost touching zero. I don't want them to clip and go below zero. And then highlights can go up towards 100 if there's anything that would be clipped in your image, then you could be like right at, I'd put it at 95. But in this photo, nothing actually should be pure white. Like those clouds aren't supposed to be blown out. So I'm gonna keep them down below my white point of 95, which by the way, you can move this line. I just, I set it here because for this project, 95 is my white point. That's actually up to you. But now our image kind of makes sense. This doesn't let us affect what is called mid-tone contrast. For that, I'm gonna go here and use color curves. And a curve lets us be a little more precise about where we are moving the highlights and shadows up and down. Towards the right are the highlights and towards the left are the shadows. And anywhere you click, you add a point. So I'm gonna add a point towards the right for highlights, point towards the left for shadows. And I'll bring the shadows a little bit down and the highlights a little bit up, the classic S curve. And I think actually I'm losing too many details in those shadows. And this is, this is why I don't do it with color wheels. I'm going to take that off. I'm just going to do this inside of my color curves. And this is just a totally different type of contrast. Like see how I can move these points closer together. That contrast looks different 
from this contrast. And this is up to you. This is a creative decision exactly where you want it to land. But, you know, I like to have what I call, you know, a little bit of mid-tone contrast by having these a little bit closer together. And uh, that, that'll be different from your other contrasts. So you add this to taste, it's up to you. And before we move on, I wanna emphasize why I don't use the Luma waveform. I'm gonna make it bigger so we can see what's going on here. If I switch back to Luma, you can see that it's only barely bumping up against 100. You know, looking at this waveform, everything seems fine. Nothing's really clipping here from what I can tell. But if I switch back to RGB overlay, you can see there's actually a lot of the blue channel that has clipped, that is past 100. That is bad, that is horrible. Like we have a beautiful expensive camera here and we're just making it look cheap. Like these clips, this looks horrible. This is what an old fashioned camcorder looks like. The reason you paid for your nice new camera is so you could get rich tones, which, you know, basically they have to be below 100 to do that. So you can only see that really clearly for me in the RGB overlay so that I can see blue, is now no longer clipping. And while we're on this clip, a final thing that I like to do is I, I usually bring my midtones down a little bit for uh, things I want to feel a little more cinematic, <laughs> a little cinema-ish. Is um, the the midtones coming down gives it that sort of like richness of tone. Let's do it to a few different clips. The best way I'd describe it is it makes the colors feel thicker, like they're just kind of more substantial. Whereas if you're bringing it down, say in the highlights, like it just looks darker and, and flatter. Those mid-tones coming down, that's where you get the the sort of the juice, the richness of, of cinema. So yeah, I, I really like to keep those a little bit low. So something in the image is kind of up near 95, but a lot of those mid-tones are coming down towards the, the lower half of of the waveform. And by the way, 10 second rant, it is offensive to me that photo editing apps do not have these waveform functionalities, these scopes inside of them, things like vector scopes are essential to me. Why can't I check my skin tones in Photoshop the same way I can in Final Cut Pro? It's totally insane and maddening that yeah, photography doesn't have these basic monitoring tools. I don't understand it. Anyway, back to, back to Final Cut. Now there's another trick I have up my sleeve. I do this very often where I'll add what is called a hue saturation curve and go into it and look for saturation versus saturation. Now everything on the right is the most saturated parts of the image of the left is desaturated. What I do is add a few points on the right side and bring it down. So what this means is that the most saturated parts of the image are a little less saturated. Like I don't go crazy with it. Um, it's a very gentle slope, but if you, I turn it on and off, you can see that it's those blues that are just way more saturated than her skin, for example. It helps bring everything a little bit more into the same saturation value. Sometimes I find oranges sort of clip and, and this just kind of brings it back. Whatever the color is, it'll recover uh, some of those clipped saturation points. Now let's get into the fun part, adding film emulation, adding some looks. But first, a quick thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace. Now, whatever kind of filmmaker you are, I'm just gonna guess that you might sometimes wanna show your work off to the rest of the world. Am I right? Well, Squarespace is the best possible way to do that. They help you create portfolios either for filmmaking or photography by embedding your work in the highest quality and surrounding it with a website that is all your design. You can post things on social media that can get lots of views, but you don't actually control that. And it can get shut down at a moment's notice. So don't rely on another platform to keep your precious work online and visible. Take control with Squarespace. You're gonna be able to design every aspect of it in just a few minutes. It's really simple. They have drag and drop templates that are completely responsive, created by their professional designers. And then the back end is taken care of for you. So you can see all the analytics that you're going to need. The SEO is done for you. You really don't have to learn anything to run a professional website. Even if you already know how to do one, it's so much easier to let Squarespace take care of it for you. So I'd highly recommend go to squarespace.com and just spend a few minutes designing your new website. And then when you are ready to launch, you can head to squarespace.com slash Tyler Stallman to get 10% off your first website or domain. I've used Squarespace from our projects I can count and they all look completely different because it's so easy to work with. So thanks again, Squarespace, link in the description. Moving on to LUTs. This is the fun part. This is when you can go crazy. First of all, let's put an adjustment layer over top of everything. Now, all you have to do is drag it on top. It's a title, by the way, it's inside of this title menu. And I'm just gonna extend it to cover our whole video here because what we're trying to do is add 
a unifying color grade to everything that kind of brings it all together. I use the same LUT for pretty much everything. Again, we're gonna go into our effects over here. I'm gonna drag over custom LUT and select the one that I always do. And even though I've used this a million times, it's never perfect at the beginning. Uh, you know, it's a pretty soft one. Like you might wanna push this further, but I'm gonna play with it for now. First of all, I don't even use it at 100% all the time for this video. I will, um, but it also does some things I don't love. So if we turn it on and off, let's watch our RGB overlay over there. You can see it's squishing the highlights a little more than I really want it to. So next in the chain, I'm going to add another color wheel and I'm gonna bring those highlights up just a little bit more. I, I don't want them pushed quite that far down. Let's take another look. It's pretty good. And keep in mind, anything you do on this top layer is now gonna be applied to everything. So you're gonna to have to probably go through all your clips again and kind of, you know, rethink them a little. Like this now feels a lot brighter than I want. I'm gonna bring those mids down. This feels warmer than I want. Also feels more saturated than I want. But there's really just no way to do all of this in one pass. You have to go through it multiple times comparing clip by clip. And it's also really useful to use the compare to. So if we go to window, show in workspace, comparison viewer, and I could click save frame. So now I'm seeing the frame that I was just on and I can compare it to anything else. So I'll go to this other clip with our same actress here. And, uh, you know, look at things like, oh, is her hair a similar shade of red? Is the saturation similar? Is her skin on a similar level? And just kind of sync those up. So whichever one I have selected, now that's the only one that I'm affecting here. Here's something I don't like that my LUT is doing. So I'm gonna manually fix it by going to hue saturation curves. I'm going to use this eyedropper and select the grass, which is our kind of green area. It actually happens to be a little more yellow. And I'm going to pull it towards being a little more cyan, a little more green, because to me, this is a little more dead grass. This is a little bit more alive grass. As you make changes like this, make sure that you flick through the rest of the video and be sure that it wasn't you know, damaging anything else. Like here, we have a lot of green in this one as well. And so we'll just turn that on and off. And yeah, it's also better in this one. I like this slightly more cyan green here. And here's another one where I'd bring the midtones down a little bit. By the way, I said there's a million different LUTs out there. It's really true. So like, let's take a look at some others. Just to remind you, there's not just one way that things can look. But I wouldn't do a lot to do something like this. Press Command-7 to bring our scopes back up. You can see it's added a ton of green to the highlights. This is a look you'll see in movies. This is like a legitimate thing to do. But I'd try to make sure you have control over that. Don't let the LUT push your image that far because it's really hard to bring it back later. So again, if you go back to mine, like I prefer things that really keep the highlights and shadows clean and are mostly playing with everything in the midtones. And now the final step, we're gonna export it and look at it on a lot of different devices. Look at it on your phone, put it on a white background, watch it on your TV, just see it all over the place and get a sense of what it really looks like because everybody has a different device and you wanna have a sense of how it's gonna appear wherever it's gonna be seen. And there's a lot more to color grading in Final Cut Pro than I was able to go over here, but I will help you out with it if you want. If you follow me on Twitter, I'm at Stallman and same thing on Instagram. And if we had more time, there is so much more to color grading in Final Cut Pro than I have time for today. But if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter, I'm at Stallman, or listen to the podcast, the Stallman Podcast. It's got lots of great info from creators you probably like and follow. But thanks for watching this video, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.